Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing word feast right here on Facebook or YouTube, whichever social media platform you're watching from today. Abel Damina is my name. There is a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. That's what this broadcast is all about today. So get ready to unlearn so you can relearn the truths concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me also advise you in the course of teaching, certain questions may arise. Just be patient, pay attention, and listen carefully because scriptures will interpret scriptures as you patiently follow the teaching of God's word. You know, the Bible tells us that the time shall come when people shall not endure sound doctrine. So sound doctrine is to be endured. So endure. You know, the word of God also tells us that with meekness, you receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul with meekness. So there's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So as the teaching of God's word begins to come, get your notebook, get your pen, follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series because we take time to holistically look at subject matters in the light of Jesus Christ. Let me encourage those of you that are connecting for the first time today, get ready to keep following. We are right here on Facebook and YouTube every day. We're here at 12 noon, GMT plus one. We're here at 6 p.m. We're here at 10 p.m. every day. You don't want to miss any of them because all of these times that I've mentioned, they are designed to equip you with sound knowledge of Jesus Christ. In the midst of a world of uncertainties, with all kinds of messages of fear going all over, you need to stock up, you need to feed yourself with the truth of the gospel so you're rooted and grounded and not moved to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Two more things to introduce to you today. If you are in a city where there is no church, Christ-centered church, where they teach the message of Christ, it is not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says God has set the solitary in families. God wants you to be a part of a local assembly, a gathering of believers where you can pray together, learn the word of God together, and effectively serve one another and go out to the world and bring the gospel of Christ. If you want to join any of our campuses around the world today, or you want to start one in your own locality and be the lighthouse in that community, all you need to do is shoot me a mail today telling me about your desire to either be a part of a campus or to start one with your location and your phone number. We will get in touch with you and help you either begin one or identify with an existing one. The last thing is I have a lot of books like you can see them displayed on the screen. All of these are resources written painstakingly to equip you answer your questions and bring you clarity of explanation of the word of God. And if you want to order for any or all of the books today, all you need to do again is shoot email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll respond to you properly and give you all the information you require to acquire these books. I'm excited, very excited. Invite a friend, tag somebody, create a watch party, but today is going to be a powerful time of teaching you the word of his grace. Fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into a service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy view. Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 1. We've been dealing with the law and the prophets in the last many weeks. For the law having a shadow. The word shadow is the Greek word skia, S-K-I-A. We mean that when something is a shadow, it is obscure. Something covers the main message and we said that the communication and the ministry of Moses was clear even the ministry of Jesus while on earth was a clear because Jesus without a parable could not speak to the people so for the law having a shadow of good things to come we ask you to underline the word good things to come good things to come the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things not the very image of the things can never, underline the word, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the commas thereunto perfect. 
So on Sunday, we were dealing with a number of realities. And we looked at what is rebranded today as the communion table or the holy communion. And we began to see that what was supposed to actually be a skier has been adopted into the church today as a ritual. And as long as you stay with the ritual, you cannot see the message. Because you have to unveil the ritual to be able to see the message. That's what a skier does. It covers the reality. I don't want to go through all that. Get the CDs if you are not here. It will change your life forever. So we now said, if you cannot offer an animal on the cross, you cannot call bread the body of Jesus. Because Brother Paul said, all these are a shadow of good things to come. They are a shadow, a skier of good things to come. And But the image is a person. The image, the substance is Christ. The body, the image, the essence the soma, that's the Greek word, the soma or the essence, the essence, the body, the substance is a person. His name is Christ. So the bread from Exodus 12 and 13 was to demonstrate the death of Jesus till he comes. And we took time to explain what it means by till he comes on Sunday. Now, so Jesus is therefore the substance of the symbols. He is a substance of the symbols. When the reality comes and you're still going after the symbols, it's actually unbelief or idol worship. Because when you see the reality, when you see Christ, when you see Jesus, yeah, you don't need the symbols because the symbols will point us to the message or to the person. When you now see the person, you don't need to go back to the symbols. It's actually unbelief. After seeing Christ, you now go back to all the things that were used as symbols to point to him. It's unbelief, number one. And of course, number two, it now results into idol worship if you're not careful. Because we didn't see bread on the cross. All right? We saw Jesus, the reality on the cross. So the question now is, why did Brother Paul use that whole illustration to communicate to people in Corinth? In the book of 1 Corinthians 11, where we read the other day. Well, before we get there, let's begin with the pretext. Why did Brother Paul use this? He told you in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Put verse 1 for me so that we see the pretext, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. I couldn't speak to the Corinthian church as unto a spiritual church, but as unto canal, even as unto babes in Christ. All right? So that already informs the mode of Brother Paul's communication to the church at Corinth. Next verse. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Verse 3. For you are yet canal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So brother Paul is using a system used for the unsaved to speak to the brethren in the Corinthian church. In Colossae, he didn't have to use that mode of communication. Because in Colossians chapter 2 verse 17, when he was talking to the church at Colossae, look at the way brother Paul put it to church at Colossae, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. That's all. He didn't have to bring bread, bring wine, and bring all of that illustration. No. Because the church in Colossae were matured. So he could speak to them like he speaks to the spiritual. What of the church at Ephesus? He didn't have to bring bread and wine to the church at Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 4. Look at the way brother Paul said it to the church at Ephesus. There is one body and one spirit even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One body, one spirit. We don't have two bodies. We don't have bread and Jesus. We have just Jesus, the body. So in the church at Ephesus, he spoke to them as spiritual. But Corinth, he couldn't speak to them as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal because they were babes. All right? So their state affected his mode of communication. Their state. So look at Moses again before we you know, zero in in Corinth. Moses in the second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 14. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remained the same veil on taking away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away in Christ. 
the veil is done away in Christ. Verse 16 of that same chapter. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the Lord. We are changed into the image, not into the symbols. When we behold Christ, we are changed into Christ, not into the symbols. Not when we behold the symbols. When we behold Christ, not the symbols, not the bread, not the wine, not the oil, not the animal sacrifices. When we now go beyond all of that to see Christ, we are changed into the same image even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So there is a beholding of Christ that is necessary when we teach the word of his grace. Now remember, glory to glory it's not glory to glory to glory. Glory to glory is simply the glory of the Old Testament which passes it away to the glory of Christ which is eternal or which has come to stay. Because the image of God is Jesus who is now the face and the glory of God. Look at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 the way brother Paul will put it. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So the face of Jesus is revelation. We taught that extensively a few weeks ago. That the face of God is revelation. So let's look at the errors a man can make. If he just stays with skia and doesn't go beyond skia into revelation knowledge. The errors a man can make. John 5, 39 to 40. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Verse 40. And you will not come to me that you might have life. All of the scriptures testify of Christ. For you to have life, you must meet Christ. You must experience the revealed Christ. Not head knowledge Christ. The revealed Christ. The revealed Christ. Very important. So errors. Number one. You will not come to me. That's number one error. If you don't come to Christ, you will continue to parambulate around. When you don't come for Christ, when all you're looking for in the scripture is not Christ, you're looking for how to find a life partner, you open the Bible just to look for the scriptures that can give you quick success in business. Instead of looking for Christ, you open the Bible and all you're looking for are the scriptures that promise divine healing. That's all you're looking for. Instead of looking for Christ, because the scriptures without Christ is religion. The life of the scriptures is Christ. He is life. Outside Christ, no life. He says, he that has the son has life. He says, I am come that you may have life. So, if all you're looking for is just a collation of scriptures to help a situation, you are in error. Because the essence for scripture is to see Christ. That's why I say you will not come to me. That you may have life. You will not come to me. That you may have life. Number two. Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine. 29. Jesus answered and said unto them. You do err. Error. Not knowing the scriptures. Nor the power of God. You do err. Not knowing the scriptures. You err means to wonder about. You wonder about. To err means to wonder about. You keep parambulating. You keep wondering about the scriptures not arriving at a destination. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he says from such, turn away. Okay, so you do wonder about when you have not accepted the explanation of the New Testament. You err when you have not accepted that the scriptures are the message of Christ. You err when you have not seen that the essence of the Bible is to bring a man to a place of wisdom through faith which is in Christ Jesus unto salvation. Once you stay away from that, you will wonder, you will be in error. You start looking at the Bible as a motivational book. You start looking at the Bible as an inspirational material. You will start looking at the Bible as a book for agricultural teaching. You will start looking at the Bible as a book for biology lectures. 
When, when you do not stay with the content and the context of the scriptures, you will stay in error. And you will keep wondering about, you will keep beating about the bush. In fact, you will get totally frustrated and disappointed after a while. All of this will tend to error. But let's summarize Moses. Let's summarize Moses. Number one, the best works of Moses from all we have taught were shadows. The best works of Moses, all, all of Moses' material, the best works were shadows. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So the best works of Moses were shadows. Number two, his best works condemned people. The best works of Moses brought people to condemnation. It is called the ministry of condemnation. Number three, the best works of Moses ministered death. It is called the ministration of death. It ministered death. Number four, there is no salvation in shadows. No salvation in it. Nobody was saved under the shadows. Nobody was born again, including Moses himself, under the shadows. So God had to bring a better covenant. And of course, in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6, pay attention. But now, hath he obtained a more excellent ministry? By how much also he is a mediator of a better. And of course, when we say better, it's not good, better, best. Better there means a lasting, an eternal, an enduring covenant. The covenant of Moses was temporal because it was the blood of bulls and animals. The covenant of Christ is eternal. His own precious blood, his life. So it's better covenant which was established upon better promises. So no salvation in the shadows. No salvation. Look at verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, say of the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, finding fault with them. Faultless means that that covenant found fault with the people to whom it was given. So Moses' best works found fault. Moses' best works found fault. In John 5.45, see Jesus' commentary on Moses' works. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. The one that accuses you to the Father is Moses. Jesus used the same word for Satan, for Moses' ministry. Kataguru, that is accusation. Accusation. Revelation 12, 10 to 11. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. That's the best of the law, to accuse, to condemn you before justice. That's the best of the law. To bring you to a place of condemnation. That's why in Christ, there is no condemnation. In the law of Moses, there is condemnation because you break one, you break all. But in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation because Christ has fulfilled the law on your behalf. So when you believe in his finished work, what he has done is credited to your account. Glory to God. I thought somebody would shout glory to God. Look at another one here. Acts 13.38. Look at brother Paul's commentary on Moses' works. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So the law of Moses did not bring justification. Because... The best of the works of Moses were shadows. Shadows. So question, was Moses under the law? No, Moses was never under the law. Why? He was saved by faith. Moses by faith. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things. The law is not substance. The law is shadow. Moses by faith. So while he gave them shadow, he himself was walking by the revelation of the substance. That's why he never kept any law. That's why he never observed the priesthood of Levi. 
That's why he went into the Holy of Holies and came out anyhow. That's why he went and married an Ethiopian woman. He was not under the law because Moses had faith in the substance. Men of faith don't live under the law. No way. Christ has redeemed us from the law. He says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Galatians 4, 5, and 6. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, 5, and 6. That we might receive the adoption of sons. So Moses had substance, not shadow. Men gave to men the revelation of God, just like Moses. All through the scripture, the revelation of God was communicated from men to men. Scripture means, therefore, what was written by human agency. The scripture is what was written by human agency. That's why John 1.17 will now say, the law was given by Moses. Not by God. The law was given by Moses. The law was given by Moses. So, was Moses under the law? We said no. Was David under the law? No. David was never under the law. Why? David understood Christ. David had faith in Christ and his faith in Christ became his justification. David understood Christ. Now, in Acts chapter 15, there was an argument on whether the Gentiles should be allowed to be born again or not, you know, by, by the apostles. There was strong argument. In fact, it was so strong. In Acts chapter 15 verse 7, now remember that argument started in chapter 11 of Acts. Now it was not over. So it surfaced in chapter 15. Look at verse 7, the way Peter will put it. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Next verse. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. No more difference. Next verse. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. This is doctrine now. Peter is establishing solid doctrine for the salvation of the Gentiles. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So the law is a yoke. And Peter said, both we and our fathers were hypocrites. Because we pretended that we kept the law, but we never kept it. Because we couldn't handle it. The law was bigger for all of us. Peter said, both we and our fathers. So every legalistic preacher you find is a hypocrite. Peter said, we are hypocrites. We were pretending. Both we and our fathers, we couldn't keep the law. So why put that yoke on these Gentiles who have received salvation through faith? God has seen their heart and has given to them the Holy Ghost. Why? The word tempt God, there is the word to try. Why try God or why taste God? Why try God? Now, the word yoke there, you know, when two animals, that's the way, that's where it came from. Two animals standing on level ground, now you stand them equally and then you yoke the two of them together. Yoke means why marry faith with law? Why marry the faith of the Gentiles in Christ with legalism? That's yoke. That's the yoke there. Just like he says, do not be unequally yoked. Bring an unbeliever and a Christian and marry them together. It cannot work. Because there is no communion between light and darkness. There is no connection between illiteracy and knowledge. There is no relationship between, um, between, between uh, knowledge and illiteracy. No connection. You can't marry them together. They are not of the same stock. They are not of the same, uh, 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 the same root. Jesus would say, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Brother Paul said, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So why tempt God to put a yoke 
a yoke. To put on the disciples a yoke. Placing something in their relationship with God. Adding something to grace. Adding something to grace. Somebody says, yes, I know we are saved by grace. But that but is a yoke. An unequal yoke. Somebody say, yes, I know Jesus died to save all of us. But work out your salvation. Then they stop there without reading the next verse that says, It is God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Salvation is the complete work of God and only God sustains those whom he saves. He is the suitor. He is saved and he is the sustainer of his product. God cannot save you and ask you to keep yourself or to maintain your salvation. He saves and he maintains. All you do is you yield. To what he's doing through you. To tempt God to see whether it will be good. Knowing that you can't join the two together. Then verse 11 of Acts 15. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We shall be saved even as they. The word grace is charis. Something freely given. God's salvation is freely given. You don't pay tight to make heaven. It's fraud. You don't pay tight to make heaven. It's fraud. We were redeemed, First Peter 1 18, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Christ. The truth of God's word is older than any man alive or dead because the word of God is eternal. And we stay with the word we don't stay with the sayings of elders. We stay with the word of God. We don't stay with the sayings of elders. What elders say is subject to error. But what God says cannot fail. We are saved by grace free. There's nothing you can do to qualify for salvation. Nothing. All of your good works plus your tithe and your sacrificial offering, and your fat, fat, Ghana must go money, cannot afford salvation. It's filthy rags. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Don't let anybody make caricature of what Christ has done in your life. I thought somebody would shout a powerful amen. amen. So it's free. The grace of God is free. Romans 8.32 He that spared not his son but gave him up for us freely. How shall he not also with him freely freely give us all things. All things. All things. So to do this to do that to qualify for salvation is a creation of man. It is not in the scriptures. Through circumcision, which is what the apostles in Acts of the Apostles were demanding. The true circumcision for the born again man is of the heart. Philippians 3.3, 3, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit. And we have no confidence in the flesh. And that circumcision happens by believing the gospel. If you still drink wine and bread... If you're still looking for Goya oil and looking for water and looking for, for, for all those articles, mantle and all that, you are far from revelation knowledge. Far from revelation knowledge. Some people even drink Goya oil. They even drink it. That's the level of their unbelief in the finished work of Christ. The power of God is not oil. It's divine healing. The power of God is not oil. The power of God is divine healing. You are washed not by water, but by the washing of water by the world. By the washing of water by the world. You are not washed by water that one pastor prayed over. You are washed by the washing of water by the world. You have the anointing living in you. You don't need Goya oil. The book of First John. The anointing you have received it. You have received it. Not you will receive. Nothing like anointing service. The anointing you have received of him abided in you. Not visited you. Abided in you. Right where you're seated tonight. The anointing is on your inside. Except you're not born of God. 
Christ in you. The Holy Ghost in you. The Father in you. What other oil are you looking for? So is Goya oil superior to the finished work of Christ? What, what darkness? What illiteracy? What illiteracy? What Christ has done cannot be improved upon by anybody. You can't improve on perfection. So, Brother Peter said, we shall be saved by grace. Purely by grace. Purely by grace. So, let's look into the prophets. The prophets. Now, please take note. The emphasis of the Old Testament prophets was what they said, not what they did. I'm sure we are finished with Moses, so we can enter the prophets. The emphasis of the Old Testament prophets was based on what they said, not what they did. That is why a John is called the greatest of, of them all. And first time we see the word prophets in the Old Testament is in Genesis chapter 20, verse number 7. And we want to apply the law of first mention. Now therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, no doubt that thou shalt surely die. Thou and all that are dying. So the first prophet in the Bible was Abraham. Law of first mention. God said to that guy, the Abimelech guy, who took Abraham's wife. He said, restore her to him, for he is a prophet. So Abraham was a prophet. It's just that many times the church don't want to look at all of that. The only thing they want to look at is Abraham's blessings. And in their mind, they're talking about material things. But Abraham was actually a prophet, a prophet of God, the first prophet. The word prophet is the word Nabi, N-A-B-I, Nabi. That's the meaning of the word prophet in the Hebrew. It's actually a Nabi, a Nabi, you know, in the Hebrew. It means a spokesperson, somebody who spoke on behalf of another. Somebody who spoke on behalf of another. And the strength of the prophets is in what they say. The strength of all the prophets of the Old Testament is in what they say. Please pay attention. Is in what they say. Exodus, let's see Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. Watch this. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Abraham. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet, shall be thy spokesman. A prophet is a spokesperson. Somebody who speaks for another. So in the Old Testament, the word prophets principally were preachers. Prophets principally in the Old Testament were preachers. And that is why, again, in the Old Testament, they were also called seers. Now, do you know why the Old Testament prophets were called seers? It's because their message was about a future event. They were called seers because their message was about a future event. So, if their message was Jesus, who was to come, that means the Old Testament prophets spoke by revelation. Because their message was concerning the Christ, who was to come. So, they spoke by revelation. That is why they were called seers. So, they were prophets as spokesmen, and seers as reflected in the content of their message. They spoke about the coming Messiah. So they spoke by revelation. The Old Testament prophets. Don't forget, I've already said that the strength of the Old Testament prophets was not in the things they did, rather in the message. So they were called seers because their message was embedded with a revelation of the Messiah who was to come. Look at Jesus' commentary about the Old Testament prophets. Matthew 13 from verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Next verse. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them. And to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Watch this. Many prophets and righteous men, so they have desired. And have not. The word desire there that was used in Jesus' commentary is the Greek word pitumio. P-I-T-H-E-I-M-E-O. It means to crave for something. They have craved for something. That word was used for angels. 
the word desire or to crave for something was used for angels in first peter chapter 1 verse number 12 unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you which the holy ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into so angels desired so prophets and angels desired prophets and angels desired luke chapter 10 verse 23 pay attention and he turned him unto his disciples and said privately blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see for i tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see these things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them so added kings there so prophets righteous men kings angels desire what did they desire first corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 but as it is written i had not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god had prepared for them that love him so it means therefore that the old testament people couldn't see their ears couldn't hear at that point in time when jesus was saying that they desired to see and couldn't see and they desired to hear but they couldn't hear he was actually making reference to the incarnation the incarnation prophets kings angels desired to see the incarnation john 1 14 that's the incarnation and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth the word was made flesh that is the incarnation that is what timothy will put in first timothy 3 16 and without controversy great is the mystery of godliness that god is manifest in flesh that is the incarnation so prophets kings angels desired to see the incarnation now the word incarnation pay attention how did jesus know that they desired to see that the prophets the righteous men and the kings desired to see the incarnation by their writings he studied their writings remember beginning from moses and all the prophets so jesus was conversant with the writings of the prophets so being conversant with their writings when he was expounding and explaining their writings he said in their writings he observed the strong craving and desire that they had to see the incarnation to see the incarnation to partake in the revelation of the incarnation now pay attention we will explain that desire in a moment but the book of matthew chapter 11 jesus now began to talk about john the baptist of course we know the background the background was john the baptist was the one who was a forerunner for jesus he came ahead of time and he began to announce that jesus was going to come he began to say well he is baptizing water but the mightier than him will come he will not use water he will baptize with the holy ghost and with fire and he began to say that the mightier than he he cannot lose the latchet of his shoe and while he was saying that one day he turned and he saw jesus and he said behold the lamb of god that taketh away the sins of the earth so jesus was introduced by the ministry of john the baptist and remember we've established that over the years that john the baptist was giving water baptism as a sign of identifying jesus among the jewish people because he was with them but they didn't know him john and jesus were cousins but john didn't know jesus so it was the water baptism that was given to him that helped him to identify now when john therefore you know um, was supposed to introduce jesus after jesus comes john was supposed to disappear because john himself said he must decrease and he must increase so john was saying that when jesus shows up i will disappear from the scene he will be obvious on the scene but when jesus came john the baptist just like some men of god will not mind their calling john the baptist went to the house of herod who was the king of that time and began to challenge herod on why he got married to a particular woman so because of that there was a conspiracy and a little girl danced and the king promised that he would give her to the half of his kingdom 
and the girl asked for the head of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was arrested, put in prison, and Jesus was in town. And John heard that Jesus was in town, and John got offended and got angry that Jesus didn't come to rescue him in prison. So one day John said to his disciples, go and ask, is he the real Jesus or should we look for another? So of course, they came to Jesus and Jesus, you know, showed them miracles and told them to go and tell John what they have seen and what they have heard. That's the background for that. Now in verse 6 of Matthew 11, verse 6, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So that's the conclusion of that foundation of the story. So Jesus now begins to explain the ministry of John the Baptist in Matthew 11 verse 13. Pay attention carefully. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So all the prophets, the law prophesied until John. That means their prophecies ended with the arrival of John until John. So question, who was John? Verse 10 and 11, Jesus explains. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. 11, verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there had not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, John the Baptist, among all that were born of women, is greater than all the prophets. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 gives us that foundational understanding in the prophecy of Malachi. But then the least in the kingdom is greater than John. So, John was sent to prepare or show the way. So John will not say he is coming. All other prophets said he is coming. Thus saith the Lord. He is coming. Since John the Baptist is the last of all the prophets and his ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus, John the Baptist will say this is he. This is he. So all other prophets, he is coming. John the Baptist, this is he. Because John the Baptist was the last and the greatest of all of them. In John 1 29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. So the greatness of the prophets is in their revelation. John the Baptist had a clearer, in fact, the, the words of John were the clearest prophecies of the whole Old Testament. The most powerful words of the Old Testament was, Behold the Lamb of God, precise and accurate. That taketh away the sins of the world. That was the most accurate. All the other prophets, where well, we shall examine them in details. All the other prophets, we have to carefully explain what they were saying. But pay attention to verse 12, which a lot of the church world have used over the years for prayer. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. A lot of churches use that for prayer. I used to think it was for prayer before. Take it by force. Well, when are the days of John the Baptist? Well, that was then. Okay? The kingdom of heaven suffered violence. The least in the kingdom is greater than John. Pay attention. The kingdom suffered violence. The least in the kingdom is greater than John. John is the greatest of those prophets. Did you observe that? Very important. Now, remember that there are other two people who saw Jesus. One was in Luke 2.25 and the other was in Luke 2.36 to 38. Luke 2.25 and that was Simeon and the other was in Luke chapter 2 verse 36 to 38. Now, the word violent is a bad translation. The word violent is supposed to be in the Hebrew is the word bestes, B-I-A-S-T-E-S. I mean in the Greek. It means to wait, an eager passion to know, an eager passion or eager pursuit. That's the meaning of violence. An eager passion or eager pursuit. And that word was never used in the negative. An eager passion or eager pursuit to know. The word suffer, the kingdom suffered violence. The word suffer means to allow 
or to move, to allow or to move. So he says, till John, not from John, until John. That is everything until the arrival of John, the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. It means there was an eager pursuit and aggressiveness to enter the kingdom. A pursuit, a desire. Luke 16, 16, used it again. Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man pressed into it. Eagerly motivated, pursuant. Now, the word to take is to obtain. Used for obtaining with favor and fervor. Used for obtaining with favor and fervor. So, the kingdom suffered violence and the violent take it, obtain it. Or, the violent obtain it with favor and favor. The word suffer is to allow. The word suffer is to allow in. It means... There was a press of all the prophets until John. John didn't press, but all the prophets pressed. He saw him, but the other prophets didn't see him, so they were pressing. And in their prophecies, they were pressing eagerly to see or to enter in, in their prophecies. They were pressing in by their prophecies, Eagerly to see or enter in. But the least in the kingdom doesn't press. He sees. John the Baptist doesn't have to press to see. He saw all other prophets in their prophecies. They were pressing to see Christ. They were pressing to see Christ. So until John. Okay. Until John. Don't forget Jesus is more than a prophet. In Matthew 11 verse 9. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you. And more than a prophet. Jesus said it. He is more than a prophet. So fundamentally, the prophets were pressing for something. Fundamentally, the prophets were pressing for something. Those who were pressing among the prophets took hold of it prophetically. Those who were pressing in their prophecies took hold of the revelation in their prophecies. John the Baptist didn't take hold in his prophecy. He saw Jesus. The Old Testament prophets took hold of Jesus in their message. But John saw. So that pressing is where the violence, where the violence came in. So it's in their prophecy that they were pressing and they took a hold of it. Why? Because all the Old Testament prophets who desire to see, all of them, they desire to see Jesus, to see the things that they saw. People like David, David was a prophet. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 30, David was one of them prophets. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So, David was a prophet. Now, what did he prophesy? Acts 3.21 Whom the heaven must receive, until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Question, how did Peter know this? Because this was Peter talking. How did Peter know this? By their writings. Again, by their writings. So, in their writings, we will see their press. In their writings, we will see their desire. And in their writings, we will see how they spoke of things they, were, they never experienced. 
in the writings of all the Old Testament prophets, we will see their desire, we will see their press, we will see their craving, and now they spoke of things they never experienced. All right? So it is in their writings that they are violent. And it is in their writing that they took it by force. And it is in their writing that you see their eager pursuit. So that scripture, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force, is referring to the prophecy of the Old Testament prophets contextually. It's not what we do today. We must take it by violence. We must take it by force. No, 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 no. The Old Testament prophets in their pursuit and in their eagerness pressed and took hold of the revelation of Jesus in their prophecies. That means they knew that there was something. So in their prophecies, they pressed in and prophesied the Messiah in their prophecies. So look at how brother Paul signifies this. Colossians 1.26. Colossians 1.26. Don't forget, Jesus said about their pursuit. He said they desired to see, but didn't see. They desired in their pursuit. They didn't see with their physical eyes, but they had revelation. Pay attention. Isaiah, who was like a senior among the prophets, Isaiah, after pursuing to see, and they didn't see, concluded by saying, eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered the hearts of men, the things that God has prepared. Then Paul answered Isaiah and said, but God hath revealed them to us. Kaboyata. But God hath revealed them to us by the Spirit. See, Isaiah said, well, after pressing, pressing, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul now answered Isaiah and said, but God had revealed them to us by his spirit. See? What they desired, what they craved for, what they pressed for has been revealed to us. Look at Colossians 1, 25 to 26. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations. It has been hid from them, but now is made manifest to his saints. If the saints are in this building, shout glory! Shout glory! Ephesians chapter 3 verse 3 to 4. How that by revelation... He made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a fall in few words. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In the Old Testament, it was a mystery. But now it is made known to the sons of men. It's now made known to the sons of men. First Peter 1 10 to 12. We'll read that a little later. First Peter 1 10 to 12. But let's look at Hebrews 1 1 to 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, Polytrophos and Polytimonus. It means glimpses of the truth. Glimpses. And our translation calls it portion. Little portion, portions of the truth, glimpses of the truth. The Old Testament prophets said, glimpses of the truth. That was the height of their pursuit. In their pursuit, the best that their cravings and desire could bring to them were glimpses of the truth. So every one of them prophets who pressed, who violently took hold of the kingdom in their prophecy, only had a glimpse only had a portion. It is when you collect all their portions put together that you arrive at the revelation of Christ. Psalm 78 verse 2. See what they said. 
I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of the old. The word skia, it means dark speeches. So we read about a prophet of the Old Testament. All of them communicated in dark speeches. Why? Because they were in pursuit of the truth. And the best they could have were glimpses or a portion. So look at Abraham, a prophet. Question. Was Abraham a prophet under the law? Huh? Was Abraham a prophet under the law? No, exactly. No. Abraham was not under the law, so he was not a prophet under the law. So we will make a distinction between prophets before the law and prophets under the law. So let's get back. First Peter 1.10 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. They searched and inquired. The word inquired is the Greek word exeto. E-X-Z-E-T-O. It means to ask after or to ask diligently. So, they were asking questions in their prophecies. In their prophecies, the Old Testament prophets were asking questions. So, their writings were inquiring for some things. Somebody like Isaiah will say, who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Inquire. They were inquiring. The other word is search. The word search is the Greek word E-Z-E-R-A-U-N-A-O. It means to investigate, to search. So they were investigating for Christ in their prophecies. It means you carry in your hand an Isaiah that was investigating for salvation. You carry in your hand an Isaiah that was investigating for salvation. Isaiah will say in one breath, your ears are heavy. Your sins have separated you from God. Then in another breath, Isaiah will say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach in chapter 61 of Isaiah. So it sounds like a contradiction, but it wasn't a contradiction. It was an investigation. It was a search for Christ. They were in a pursuit. They were full of desire. So in their prophecy, they were seeking and searching and inquiring for Christ to see him. So Jesus said they desired but never saw. The best they could get were glimpses. Glimpses. Verse 11 of that first Peter chapter 1. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Searching was a major theme in their writings. A major theme. The spirit of Christ was not in them. Actually, they had the spirit which testified of Christ. That's the way it should be interpreted. They had the spirit which testified of Christ. Then verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed... That not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, which the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So the revelation is not in their writings. They wrote their inquiries but now we have the revelation of what they wrote in the epistles so in the epistles you understand what they were saying I mean imagine what they were searching for the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow of his salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you 11. Searching what or what manner of time 
the spirit of Christ, one, which was in them, this signified. When he testified beforehand, the sufferings of Christ, Christ mentioned twice in one verse to establish emphatically that what they were seeking and searching for was Christ. Now, imagine David is in a deep crisis. David the prophet. He fell in a cave in a deep crisis between life and death. He was not even sure of coming out of the cave. He was not sure of surviving that crisis, that accident. But the greatest desire of his heart, in spite of his situation, was the revelation of Christ. That was his search. So, yet, because of that strong search in his spirit, in a crisis situation, he cried out to the spirit of prophecy, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which was an insight. David, by prophecy, laid hold in his pursuit of Christ's cry on the cross. Because that was the search in their heart. They were seeking for Christ, all the prophets. So Hebrews 11.39 now tells us, And this all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. That means that the books of the Old Testament prophets did not have an answer in them. They didn't have an answer in them. Look at verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Perfect means to reach the destination. They didn't reach the end. So their prophecies were search engines like Google. Their prophecies were search engines. So the very first prophet we will examine is Noah. That's the first person we'll examine. But remember, Enoch was a prophet before Noah. Before the law. Enoch was the first prophet actually. But silent. Because in Hebrews 11 verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony. That he, Enoch, please God. What is faith? The substance of things. So Enoch had faith in the gospel. The substance. Not the shadow. The substance of things hoped for. So Enoch had faith in the substance of things. How do we know that? Genesis 5.23 And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not for God took him. He walked with God is the word alak. Someone who takes your instruction. He walked with God. He took God's instruction or he believed in God's testimony. Enoch was born in Genesis 4, 17. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Alright? So Enoch was born in Genesis 4. And in 5, the man took heed to God's instructions or believed the gospel. That's why in Hebrews 11, 5, he now says, By faith, Enoch, he believed the gospel. And the faith of Enoch is the substance of things hoped for. So Enoch believed in the substance, which is the message of Christ. Even though he didn't see Christ, but he believed in the message. He took heed to God's instruction. So you won't see faith in Genesis. But it was faith to believe God's testimony. Then he says he was not found. What happened to Enoch and Elisha? They died but their bodies were hidden. So that these men couldn't see them. How do we know that? John 3.13 And no man had ascended up to heaven. This is Jesus talking. But he that came down from heaven... Even the son of man, which is in heaven. So Jesus emphatically said, nobody has gone to heaven before. Not Enoch, 
not Elijah, not even Moses. All right? Then look at Hebrews 11, 13. These all died in faith. Abraham, Enoch, Elijah, Moses, all died in faith. Not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them and embraced them. And confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So therefore, when he said Enoch was translated. The word translated is the Greek word metate. Time me, M E T A T I T H I M I is positive. That means what happened to him, he deemed he took him and his body was not found. His body was not found, not that he went to heaven. Because the Bible says they were not made perfect, meaning they didn't go to heaven, they were not made perfect. Look at Jude 14, so you know that Enoch was a prophet. And Enoch also, the servant from Adam, prophesied of this, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That number is not accurate. That number is not correct. It can be with ten thousand of his saints. But of course, you can imagine how many people were there in the world of Enoch. So, um, he wasn't accurate in the number because I'm telling you the people that Jesus will take out of this world, they are in billions. They are not in thousands. They are in billions. So his walking with God relates to his prophesying also. So now look at Noah in Genesis 6, 3. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. And this is where sometimes you hear preachers say, well, man was given 120 years to be on earth. But after this verse, people live for more than 500 years. So if this verse was about physical, biological age, then people should have been dying at 120 from Exodus, Genesis chapter 6. But people live beyond that. Meaning, what he was saying needed interpretation. Alright? So, what was Noah saying, now he said, and the Lord said, in proper interpretation, it wasn't God speaking there, it was Noah. So what Noah was saying is, my spirit shall not strive with man. Because Noah preached and preached and preached for 120 years and the people didn't believe. So he concluded that my spirit shall not strive with man. 120 years of preaching, nobody believed. So what happened? The door of the ark was shut and that was it. So it wasn't referring to biological age. It was referring to the duration of the ministry of Noah to bring people to a place of faith in Christ. The word strive there is the word dig, D-I-G. It means to plead with someone. To plead with someone or to speak with someone. That is, you will preach for 120 years. That's what God was saying to Noah. You will preach for 120 years. Hebrews 11, 7. Look at the way Hebrews will record. He exonerates God from asking Noah to build the ark. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So what is simply saying in Hebrews is that it wasn't God that asked Noah to build the ark. Noah built the ark as his way of communicating to the people. There was nothing in that ark that would have stopped that ark from being destroyed by the flood. What kept that ark was the word of faith in the mouth of Noah. The word of faith. Meaning they could have entered the touch house and Noah's word will keep them in that touch house. They could have entered the car, anything. So it's not the ark. That prevented the water from reaching them. It was the word of faith in the mouth of Noah that kept the ark. Why? Because the ark was Noah's way of communication to the generation that he was sent to. So Noah and his eight children were saved from the water. Why? Because Noah believed in the message. It was Noah's faith that preserved his children from the flood. Why? Because Noah demonstrated death and resurrection by building the ark. 
the ark was submerged and after the flood went, the ark came up. He demonstrated death and resurrection and his faith in it. But Noah kept looking forward for a city whose builder and maker was God. Remember, later on, some of Noah's children did not believe the gospel. So it was not the children of Noah's faith that saved them from the flood. It was Noah's faith that kept them from that flood and protected them from that destruction, giving them a chance to believe the gospel. And yet, they didn't believe the gospel because the issue there was Christ. Now, the words of Noah, therefore, kept, uh, you know, the ark from being destroyed. So the effect of the miracles, pay attention. Number one, Enoch's body. Enoch's body was taken that you should not see that, which was a symbol of rapture. Number two, Noah's ark was a symbol of resurrection. Number three, Abraham took his son to Mount Moriah. And there in Mount Moriah, God told Abraham, don't kill Isaac, there's a ram. The ram died in the place of Isaac, which was a figure of Jesus. So with every of those miracles, it pointed to something that had to do with the message of Christ. So what was peculiar was not the miracles of the prophets, but their message. Because their message was Christ. That's what was peculiar. Please don't miss that one. If you miss that one, you shouldn't have come to church. What was peculiar was their message, not their miracles. The message of the prophets. So let's look at John the Baptist. We'll read four scriptures. Matthew 3, 11 to 12. Mark 1, 8. Luke 3, 16 to 17. And John 1, 33 to 34. So we start with the first one. Matthew 3, 11 to 12. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn off the chaff with unquenchable fire. Mark 1, 8. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. No fire here. Holy Ghost. Luke 3, 16 to 17. John answered, saying unto them, All, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I, cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to lose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John 1, 33 to 34. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So Matthew and Luke said Holy Ghost and fire. Mark and John said Holy Ghost. All right? So in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus now referred to John's baptism, Jesus did not include fire. Why? Fire talks about the judgment for people who reject the gospel. Fire is a symbol of judgment. That if you do not believe the gospel, they say they're coming when the door of salvation will be shut and you will be exposed to judgment. That's the fire. So when Jesus spoke, he separated Holy Ghost baptism from fire. So when brother Paul will now talk of John, he said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, talking of Christ who will come. That is how to look at the prophets. So the words of the prophets must be interpreted because when they say Holy Ghost and fire, the interpretation will be, today we have Holy Ghost baptism which is being born again. But fire is judgment for people who reject Christ. So their words must be rightly divided. The prophet's words must be rightly divided. And we're going to be doing this on Sunday very brutally in this house. The words of the Old Testament prophets. All right? So you need to understand and see what the prophets were searching for. They were searching for Christ. Any other thing was just, you know, by the side. The main crux of the message of the Old Testament prophets 
was their search for Christ. For example, Samson in Judges chapter 16. We all know the story of Samson. How that he was sleeping with prostitutes finally. Delilah came and um, you know, unraveled him, cut off his hair and all that. And Samson was about to die. Look at his prayer in, in Judges 16.25. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson. He may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. And he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the Lord that held him by the hand, suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women. And all the lords of the Philistines were there. And they were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee. And strengthen me, I pray thee. Only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood. And on which it was borne up. Of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, And the house fell upon the Lord. And upon all the people that were daring. So the dead which he slew at his death. Were more than they which he slew in his life. But this same thing happened to David. And David said oh God take not your Holy Spirit from me. David knew that the Holy Spirit was not gone. That's why I said don't take him. He didn't say restore the Holy Spirit. He said take not the Holy Spirit. Now the question is. Those people that died with Samson, was it the power of God that killed them? Well, I leave you to think about that before we meet on Sunday. Was it the power of God that killed them, those people that died with Samson? Well, just to help you while you think, remember Luke chapter 9 verse 51? They said, Jesus, shall we command fire to come down and consume? And Jesus rebuked them, just like he rebuked demons. He rebuked them like he rebuked demons. You didn't hear that. He rebuked them like he rebuked demons and he said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Glory to God. What a God we serve. A God that does not destroy, does not delight in destruction. A God that does not kill, but gives life. A God that does not destroy, but restores life. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So we rely on their prophecies, not their experiences. We rely on the prophecies of the prophets, not their experiences. Elijah called down fire. That's not our lesson. Our lesson is Christ out of the message of Elijah. Their experiences is not what we rely on. Their message because a prophet is known by what he says and the revelation in it. So that's how we'll be studying the Old Testament prophets. That's how we shall examine them. And find out what they said. And then look for Christ in their search. Look for Christ in their inquiries. Remember beginning from Moses. And all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. The things concerning himself. So in the law. And in the prophecy of the prophets, Christ was the center of their message. And we rely on their message and not their experiences. Glory to God. Well, stand on your feet tonight. That's all we've got in this service. We rely on their message, not their experiences. I'd like you to walk to two, three people. Tell them, we rely on the message of the prophets, not their experiences. Say that to two more people. We rely on the message of the prophets, not their experiences. The last person, tell the last person, we rely on the message of the prophets, not their experiences. Glory to God. Well, if you're blessing that, go ahead, give Jesus a shout in this place. Glory! We see Jesus. We see Jesus. Amen. Lift your right hands to heaven, Father. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. Revelation knowledge keeps growing. The mystery keeps being demystified in Christ. We are not like them who desire to see but didn't see. We see Jesus. 
we see Jesus. Glory to God. And Lord, because we see you, in you, Jesus, we see ourselves. And because we see ourselves, no inferiority complex, no timidity, no weakness. Because we see ourselves in you, we are righteous. We are strengthened with might in the inner man. We are more than conquerors. We are blessed beyond the cost. We are kept by the power of God. And I decree tonight, every sick body be healed. Every yoke be destroyed. Every barrier be terminated. Every struggle ends. In the name of Jesus, great grace upon you. You are blessed beyond the cause. You are kept by the power of God. You are kept by the grace of God. It is well with you today. I give God praise for answer prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer shout that amen like thunder. Well, go ahead. Give Jesus a great shout. Celebrate. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. What a time of learning. A time of unlearning and a time of relearning the word of his grace. Brother Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you your inheritance among the sanctified. The word has come with clarity. Please don't go away. If there's anything that was wrong in your life, the word of God has gone forth to fix it. I rebuke sickness. I rebuke pain. I rebuke confusion. I rebuke discomfort. Now, receive healing. Receive a miracle where you need one today. In the name of Jesus, receive a miracle. I clear every confusion out of your life. We rebuke fear and the hold of darkness is broken in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I'm excited. Now listen very carefully. I want to encourage you. I have a lot of books like you can see them displayed on the screen. All of these are resources written painstakingly to equip you, answer your questions, and bring you clarity of explanation of the Word of God. Shoot email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll respond to you properly and give you all the information you require to acquire these books. You can order them from our office, either the books, the CDs, or the DVDs, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Shoot us a mail today with your orders, and we will ensure that we reach out to you today. If you're in a city where there's no church, where the message of Christ like this is preached or taught, that is already an opportunity for you to serve Jesus by getting involved with ministry. This is the way it works. All you need to do is shoot us a mail. We will take time and equip you and prepare you to begin an extension of our church ministry called a campus where other believers in your locality can assemble with you in your own venue and learn together with you the message, pray with you, and together all of you can reach out to more people with the truth of the gospel. Or you're in a place where you desire to just belong to the campus, shoot us a mail with your location today. We'll connect you to the nearest campus to where you are of our ministry. It always a joy to serve you the grace of God. Always a joy to bring you clarity, to equip you, to build you up in the knowledge of Christ. I'm excited today. Looking forward to hearing from every one of you today. And don't forget to stay tuned for the next broadcast that comes up in a few hours from now. Share with people about what God is doing on this platform. And until we connect with you again, enjoy the grace of Christ and be blessed. Amen. Amen to your victory station.